Hello, this is Mike Wolfer. This is my case study assignment for Nursing 335. Um, I chose to do the case study um, regarding the patient with the ischemic stroke. So I'll first go ahead and read over the um, presentation of the patient. So the presentation states that the patient was admitted to the floor status post TPA for a right MCA ischemic stroke three days ago. Um, they put on the call light with a headache rated um, 8 out of 10 pain. Um, when I go in the room, the patient's left grip is much weaker than their baseline um, when the patient tries to grab a pitcher of water. The past medical history of this patient is diverticulosis for the past four years, occasional lower back pain that's controlled with over-the-counter NSAIDs, tension headaches, and atrial fibrillation. The medications that they're taking are metoprolol, 25 milligrams twice a day, Xeralto, 20 uh, milligrams, Pantoprazole, 20 milligrams, um, and they have lactated ringers running to keep the vein open um, and an IV that's in the left uh, AC. So I chose this case study in particular because I thought it was really interesting and a little difficult. Um, this patient kind of has something to me interesting going on. So the patient had TPA for a stroke three days ago. Um, but they also have a history of AFib. So that makes it kind of a really delicate balance to make sure that the patient is properly anticoagulated, although they had a really strong anticoagulant that was given to them to correct the ischemic stroke. So when we're looking at their medications, I'm gonna start there. Um, they are taking Zeralto for the AFib and being that this is the case study and there's not a lot of information there for all we know, you know, maybe the AFib was what caused the stroke in the first, first place. Maybe they threw a clot somehow. Maybe they forgot to take their medication or something like that happened. And the AFib threw a clot and that's what landed them in the hospital in the first place. But regardless, um, if this is the presentation of the patient, I would first need to assess as part of the nursing process and get a set of vital signs. So um, having a set, full set of vital signs is important, but specifically what I want to know the most is what is that blood pressure like and what is their O2 set like? Um, I want to know blood pressure and oxygen for perfusion, right? So um, if the patient's satting, a good O2 sat, they're not having trouble breathing, that's a relief. Um, they're not having any oxygen, you know, being blocked off in the brain. Um, and then the blood pressure. So we want to make sure that we have patients that are not hypertensive. Um, but interestingly, since this patient is post ischemic stroke, there is a level of permissive hypertension that we might allow. Um, you know, it doesn't say in the case study how long this patient, you know, had um, had blood supply cut off in the brain because of the stroke. So we want to be able to reperfuse the brain. And so the physicians might allow some permissive hypertension. And I'm totally taking a stab in the dark here because I haven't really taken care of a lot of stroke patients. Um, but that's something I immediately thought about, especially because this was previously an ischemic stroke. So that is something I want to know. What's that blood pressure like? What is that um, O2 sat like? So if those two things seem to be okay, um, the patient is having a headache. Now that's where things get a little difficult because this patient does have a history of tension headaches. The patient's been in the hospital for several days. They, you know, have undergone some pretty, you know, a pretty big medical issue 
being that they have a stroke, so they, it could just be, you know, a headache that came on from everything that's going on. So with that being said, you know, we could definitely medicate the patient. But just thinking out loud here, if it was me, um, I, I think I would kind of snap into action a little sooner. You know, being that the patient had um, a stroke three days ago and that they have a history of AFib, I, you know, would like to err on the side of caution. I don't know if other nurses would do it that way. I don't know if there's anything else assessment-wise that I'm missing, but I think that I would want to err on the side of caution and start acting um, more quickly, even if the patient, you know, just had a normal tension headache. So what I mean by that is get the vital signs, like I said, check what that blood pressure is like, check that O2 sat. You know, is my patient on a telemonitor? If not, they definitely need to be because they're post-stroke and they are um, AFib. So immediately, if I had a patient with a history of AFib, I would be calling the doc and getting them on monitor if they weren't already. You know, maybe something's going on there that we don't know about and we need to know. Um, you know, and then proceeding with some more in-depth focused neurological assessments. So the, the scenario says that the patient has a change in grip. You know, it doesn't say specifically, um, you know, if the patient, it, it doesn't really go into detail about what the baseline is. It just says that there's a difference in baseline. Now, is that a different in, difference in baseline from the last shift? Or is it a difference in baseline from the total hospital visit? Because if the patient, you know, let's say was coming to my floor on med surge and they, you know, developed this deficit after the stroke they had on another unit, the ER, the, you know, the PCU, whatever you want to call it, you know, or wherever they were, maybe it's not so much of a big deal. You know, but if I got in report that this patient had no deficits and now all of a sudden they do have a left-sided deficit, well, of course, that's a problem. So going over and doing another stroke assessment again, because just because this patient had um, a stroke a few days ago doesn't mean that it can't happen again, especially with that history of AFib, right? So I would be, you know, trying to assess neurological function. So are they alert and oriented? Um, testing those grips, making sure I can feel, you know, a difference or not in their grips, watching the patient pick up that pitcher of water again, see if maybe they were just shaky, maybe they're feeling pain from a headache, or is this something more serious? Definitely. Um, you know, I would probably test some cranial nerves, you know, uh, check Perla, get out my pen light, look at um, pupillary responses, you know, am I seeing a big difference in my pupils, right? Um, you know, as I mentioned, the patient could be having another ischemic stroke, but let's play ball in a different way here. Maybe the patient is having a hemorrhagic stroke, right? TPA is a really potent medication. And the patient was also on Zeralto, so it was on another form of anticoagulation, you know, understandably because of AFib, but, you know, it, it, it definitely, to me, I would be concerned about it, especially because, you know, in an emergency situation, I'm not the ER nurse in this case, this happened three days ago, but do we absolutely know that the patient stopped the medication in the appropriate time to receive the TPA? So there's a lot of questions. Um, so when I say snap to action, I want my assessments, I want my vitals, I want my blood pressure, my O2 sat, all of my good neuro assessments on this patient. And then honestly, to err on the side of caution, I would send them to CT. Call the doctor, get an order, send them to CT. Get them on telemonitoring if the doctor wanted more than that. Get a stat EKG on this patient too. Make sure they have no chest pain, no shortness of breath, no cardiac changes as well. Definitely important for that. Um, so I'm looking at their med list as well. The Zeralto makes sense for the AFib. Pantoprazole, maybe just, you know, acidity, GERD, or anything like that. Um, they have a uh, history of diverticulosis, so maybe that. Um, 
it's interesting that they're taking NSAIDs, um, taking the NSAIDs and the Xarelto and having recent TPA administration. I mean, there's a lot of blood thinning happening there. So, like I said, it, it, anything's possible. Um, maybe the patient is having a hemorrhagic stroke at this point. So, you know, it's really important that this has been a few days since the patient had the first stroke. We don't want to be accidentally or unnecessarily administrating this Seralto and this, um, you know, maybe giving them NSAID pain relief when in reality we're making a hemorrhagic stroke worse, but we won't know that unless the patient is going to CT and we figure that out. Um, or on the flip side of that, as I'm thinking about it, you know, maybe we've held off on um, giving the patient the Xarelto. You know, have we continued it? Is it appropriate to continue? I don't really know. I don't, um, interestingly, even though I work in um, a facility that has a lot of elderly patients and, and does receive a lot of strokes, I personally have not taken care of a lot of patients that have had past strokes in the same hospital stay. So I don't actually know what the protocol is for, you know, continuing something like a Zeralto or one of those after a stroke, you know, several days after a stroke, what's that timeline look like? So I would want to be confirming that with the physician because that could also cause a problem. It's th that's why this case study is so interesting. There's such a delicate balance there. You know, the patient needs to be anticoagulated because of the history of AFib, but with TPA, you know, it's, it's a balance. We can't be giving them so much blood thinning that we're now sending them into a hemorrhagic stroke. And as I said, the only differentiator there is getting them to the CT, right? So that we can know, is there a stroke at all? Is this just a tension headache? Um, or is it, unfortunately for the patient, another type of stroke, right? Is it a hemorrhagic stroke because they're over anticoagulated? Is it an ischemic stroke because we haven't continued the anticoagulation that they need to keep them from having another stroke from the, from the AFib? So we need to know that and that's what the CT is going to be able to do for us. We can also pull um, labs as well, PT, um, PTT, INR. Um, you know, I don't have too many patients on Seralto, and from what I remember, I don't know that it's associated with a lab. I think that's what draws patients to it so much, especially, is that they don't have to go and get recurrent lab draws like some other anticoagulants. Um, but I'm not sure. So I would still check blood labs anyway, PT, INR, all of that to make sure that they're within range. And personally, I would get this patient off of the NSAIDs. You know, if anything, just because they're already taking anticoagulants, you know, um, they have a history of diverticulosis, so if that goes um, south and they're, they're now in diverticulitis, we don't want them getting a bleed from inflammation in the you know, in the intestines, we don't need that either. So we would maybe switch them to Tylenol if that was, you know, okay with their liver function and everything like that, or some kind of other pain relief. I just think that's for the best. And you know, it is interesting here too, you know, let's say that everything checks out and it's all a fluke, and this is just a tension headache, nothing more. Um, they don't have a long-term or like, you know, they don't have a home med here that they're taking for the tension headaches. You know, the NSAIDs are mentioned here specifically for the lower back pain. So what can we get them, you know, that's going to help with that? So I think that's, you know, important for this patient too and making sure that it's not going to negatively affect anything else that they have. You know, and they're also on metoprolol here. So if we're in a state where the patient does need to be permissively hypertensive, you know, is that a good thing to give them? You know, the metoprolol could be, you know, I assume it's for the AFib, there's no um, history of hypertension. So we'd have to talk to the physician about how to manage that exactly. You know, you don't want um, 
again, it's such a balance in this patient. You don't want to give um, the medication if you're trying to, you know, help reperfuse the brain. But at the same time, we have to be extremely mindful of that AFib. So we need them on that cardiac monitoring. Honestly, I would have this patient on a tele floor. I don't even know if I would accept them on a med search floor. Not quite yet. Um, without having these kind of details ironed out first. You know, how are we going to make sure that we, we keep them safe with their AFib and, you know, make sure they have the best option for recovery with, um, with perfusion to the brain after having an ischemic stroke. So, you know, remote telemonitoring is fine, but, you know, I don't know what kind of medicines the doctor would have to prescribe in order to keep the AFib under control, but also allow for the correct blood pressure. You know, I don't even know if that's possible with what you could do on a med search for. It might require um, a higher level of care. Don't know for sure, just thinking out loud, but that might be it. Um, trying to think. Hmm, okay, let's see what else this says here. Uh, what got the patient to this point? Um, probably beating a dead horse, but I personally think reading this that, like I said, the patient is in this really delicate balance of, you know, being treated for the ischemic stroke and then being taken care of in a way that their medications protect them from um, another stroke, be it uh, hemorrhagic or ischemic, because the patient uh, was, you know, heavily anticoagulated for the TPA, and now, you know, we have to make sure that they are resuming their meds, but it has to be in an appropriate time. Um, so it, it could really go either way with this patient. They could have, um, you know, thrown a clot from, from AFib, maybe it's from something else. I mean, we don't know the full picture. We don't know if they have high cholesterol or we don't know what their blood labs are like. So it could be a number of things, but based on what we do know, that is a strong possibility. So they could have landed here from a clot they threw from AFib, causing an ischemic stroke. And now we're trying to make sure that they're not having another stroke. So not having another ischemic stroke because of lack of resuming those um, AFib medications or a hemorrhagic stroke because we maybe started the medications too soon after the TPA and now they're having a brain bleed. Don't know if that's right. That's just what I'm thinking. Um, So yeah, labs and diagnostics, just to touch on that again, CT definitely, um, telemetry monitor monitoring for sure, um, and EKG maybe, um, if the doctor if wants that, and then blood labs, you know, we want CBC, we want PT, INR, all of those things to make sure the patient is doing okay. Um, are the medications appropriate? Um, like I said, the NSAIDs, I would discontinue them. I think it's too, um, too prone to leave the patient uh, to bleed. So get a different pain medication over the counter for that. Um, yeah, the metoprolol is rate control for the AFib. The Xeralto is anti anticoagulation for the AFib. Pantoprazole. Um, I don't know that it has any cardiac implications. I've, I've never known it to. I mean, it could, I, I suppose. But um, no. The LR, um, we're only running it TKO. Um, You know, it is isotonic, maybe, I'm trying to think, I, uh, you know, for reperfusion purposes, it, it's probably fine, you know, and maybe the patient is having a headache because they're, we're allowing them to be hypertensive just a bit. Um, 
but the headache is so acute, so it's really hard to tell. So I don't know that running LR at a, you know, like a 5 ml per hour is really going to do anything. I could be wrong, but I just don't see there being a problem with that. Um, yeah, so that's really what I would do for this patient. I, it was a very long-winded answer and kind of all over the place. And I apologize in speaking a little quietly because my husband's sleeping and I'm trying to get some work done after work for school. Um, but I, I think that's it. That's really all that I know with my knowledge um, about how I would go about treating and taking care of this patient. Um, so if I missed anything, just let me know. Thanks.